It's Easter morning. He's alive. But I want to tell you what I believe. I believe that too many of us as Christians live on Saturday. The disciples were afraid on Saturday. They were scared. They were looking for the Roman soldiers to come and take them away. They did not realize that they had a Savior who was still alive. They did not realize that on the third day He was going to come out of the grave. Yes, He prophesied it. Yes, He told them. But like a lot of us, we live in the bondage that it's Saturday. Because He's alive, we can face tomorrow. Because He's alive, we can face death. Because He's alive, we can face anything that Satan, his demons, and hell throws at us because He's alive. Too many of us live like we're on Saturday. And it makes me think of a story that I heard about Brother Ronnie. He looked out his window one morning and he saw his dog with the neighbor's little white rabbit in his mouth. The dog was shaking the rabbit fiercely. Now Ronnie had already had problems with his neighbor. And he feared that this was going to make things even worse. So he dropped everything that he was doing and he ran outside hoping to rescue the poor little rabbit. <clears throat> he grabbed a broom and pushed on the dog until the dog dropped the defenseless little white rabbit. Ronnie took a quick look at the rabbit to see, <clears throat> or he took a quick look to see if the neighbor was watching. And he quickly grabbed the rabbit and he took the critter into the garage. Too late, the rabbit was dead. Ronnie panicked. Ronnie said, what am I going to do? The little white rabbit was covered in dog slobber and mud and Suddenly, an idea popped in his head. He rushed into the house with the rabbit in his arms. He rushed upstairs to the bathroom. Ronnie ran hot water in the bathtub and proceeded to give the dead rabbit a good bath. He managed to get all the dog slobber and mud off of the rabbit. And next, he took a towel and he dried the rabbit off. The rabbit still was damp and its fur looked terrible. So Ronnie went into Barbara's part of the bathroom and got her blow dryer and her brushes and her combs and he went to work on the little rabbit. After about an hour of tedious work, Ronnie succeeded in making the rabbit look normal. But what could he do? He wanted to avoid a bad scene with his neighbor. But then he had another idea. He decided to wait till dark. And then he slipped over into the neighbor's backyard. He found the rabbit hutch. And he placed the dead animal inside. He took special care to prop it up and to put it in there so that it would appear to be alive. The next morning, Brother Ronnie got up early, as his habit is, and he was sitting out on the back deck drinking coffee. And he heard the screams of terror coming from next door. Ronnie quickly jumped and he ran over to the neighbor's house. And there is his neighbor who owned the rabbit. And then there are other neighbors who have heard the scream. And they are there as well. And Ronnie ran over and said, what is the matter? And the neighbor looked at him and said, Fluffy died three days ago. We buried him and he's back. <laughs> but Fluffy was still dead. <laughs> They buried Christ, and on the third day, he was not still dead. Amen. Turn with me to Luke, the 24th chapter, 24th and 1st verse. Very familiar passage of Scripture. And I'm going to try to get done as quick as I can today because I know you want to beat the Methodists to the restaurant. Can I get an amen? <laughs> We're really proud to have Brother George with us today. And I can hear Miss, Miss Patsy singing. That just, that just lifts me up so much. And we're, we're so glad that all of you are here. And I'm going to throw this out. I've got to say this. If you're looking for a church home, you won't find a better one than the little church by the road. Luke 24 and 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened... As they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Amen. Amen. He is not here, but he is risen. 
Amen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his word, and then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. The message of Easter is this, death is not the end. The message of Easter is this, death is not the end. The events on Sunday morning over 2,000 years ago in a tomb on the other side of the world prove that there is life beyond death. Jesus died, and I want you to think about this for a moment. The disciples were grieving. They had seen Jesus being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was taken through a series of illegal trials, even by the Jewish people and by the Roman government. Jesus was whipped. He was handed over to be crucified. He was nailed to a cross, and for six hours he hung on that cross in agony. About three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus uttered the words that we need to always remember. It is finished. It is finished. Nothing else needed to be done. And when the disciples heard that Jesus had been crucified, listen, their hopes, their dreams, their desires was all crushed. They were living on Saturday and in Saturday. Everything they thought would happen has not happened. They thought when he said it's finished, they thought it's over. Well, this man, he, he, he had healed others. Now he's dead. This man had walked on water. We had seen him. And now we're all alone. What are we going to do? They can come kill us. They can come crucify us. Their life as they knew it was over. It would never ever be the same. They could be killed just like Jesus Christ. Yes, he was dead. Here's what's running through their minds. He had raised other people from the dead. But, but now he's dead. He can't raise himself from the dead. He's dead. Nothing can change that. Nothing can raise him from the dead. But little did they know. Amen. Let me tell you all a secret. Are you ready? Amen. Are you really, really ready for a secret? This should make a Baptist stand up and shout. Here's the secret. Yes, he was dead. But death had just been defeated. Death is not the end. He is proven that he was king of kings and lord of lords. He was proven that he was man. He died. And yet on the third day he proved that he was God because he came out of that tomb. He, he left that tomb. The rock was rolled away not so he could get out but so we could get in. The tomb is the only place in the world where you can go today and stand and see nothing. Amen. 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 He is alive today. So I want to tell you, i got three points today real quick. Point number one, death has met its match. The, Jesus was dead. His disciples understood that. The experts confirmed it. The Roman executioners were experts at killing people. Do you know that? They knew how to kill people. And they knew if you were dead or not. In fact, it was prophesied that not a bone would be broken. Listen, this was prophesied, y'all. There is so much prophecy about Jesus Christ that we don't have time to get into. But it was all fulfilled by Jesus on that cross. They, they would break the, the people who were being crucified's legs. So they couldn't push up and breathe so they would die quicker. But there was not a bone broken on Jesus. It was prophesied. They knew that Jesus was dead. He was not in a coma. He was not knocked out. He was not uh, just pretending to be dead. He was dead. He was placed in a tomb. The tomb was sealed and there were guards put around it. And it seemed that death had won the victory. It seemed that Satan had won. And I'm sure that Satan and his demons were off in the corners laughing. We have defeated him. We put him on a cross. I want to stop right there and say this. Satan did not put Jesus on the cross. 
The Roman soldiers did not put Jesus on the cross. The Jewish officials did not put Jesus on the cross. What put Jesus on the cross was his love for you and I. Because he is the only way that we can be forgiven of our sins. I don't care what Buddha says. I don't care what what Mohammed says. I don't care what anybody on TV says. There's one way to get into heaven. And that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that blood was not spilt. It was poured out on that cross for the right righteousness of us to save us. The devil couldn't defeat him. Death couldn't hold him. The tomb couldn't contain him. Death had met its match. And I'm going to read to you from Acts, the second chapter, and the 24th verse. And I want you to listen to this. And if this don't make a Baptist happy, I don't know what will. Acts 2 and 24. Whom God raised up, having loosened the pain of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Death could not hold him. That's why I know that we're going to live after we die. In fact, what we call living now is not living. You are never going to be alive until you die. Jesus said he came that we might have life. And yes, we can have a better life here. And it's time that we quit living on Saturday and moved into Sunday. It's time that we quit living on Friday and moved into Sunday. Because yes, he died on the cross. But on Sunday, he came out of the grave. And because he came out of the grave, the whole world has changed. And we now have confidence that we know that we will be in heaven with him one day if we're covered in the blood. Back in my younger days, a couple of years ago when I was about 20, (laughs) we'd watch wrestling on Saturday night at 5 o'clock. Georgia Championship Wrestling. Dusty Rhodes. How many members Dusty Rhodes? Tommy Wildfire Rich. The masked something something. We had all these wrestlers, and after we'd watch it, me and my buddies would get in the floor, and we'd try all these holes on each other. As y'all can tell, I'm not a little guy, okay? I was bigger. (laughs) (laughs) Whose story is this? (laughs) No, you're not. As I was saying, I'm not a little guy, and all my buddies was little. And we'd get in the floor and wrestle, and I could always beat them because I weighed more than they did, and I was taller than they would, had longer arms. And I'd let them kind of try their holes out on me until I got to a certain point where I got tired, and I let them think they were winning. And then all of a sudden, I'd reverse it, and I'd win them. I'd win, and I'd pin them. That's exactly what Jesus did to Satan. He let him think that he was winning. He let him think that he was dead. Let me tell you what Jesus was doing. Jesus was in hell getting the keys to Satan's house while he was dead. You know what? Satan has to ask Jesus to get the keys to go into his own house. That's how much Satan is a defeated foe. Jesus overcome death. He overcome hell. And he overcome the grave. I'm not scared of the grave. You know why? Because I'm not going to be in that grave. I'm not scared of hell because I'm not going there. And listen, Jesus said, he said, I'm dying because I love you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have life everlasting. For three days and three nights, Jesus looked like a loser, but he got up. (laughs) He got up. He arose. Death had been defeated. And that brings me to point number two. Fear has been defeated. Fear has been defeated. When Jesus died, his followers became a frightened, disoriented bunch. Listen to what it says in John 19. And after these things, what things? After the death of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for the fear of the Jews. He was afraid. He asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus And Pilate granted permission, and he came therefore and took away his body. He was afraid. Listen, it's time that we quit being secret followers of Jesus. It's time that we boldly stood. Why? Because Jesus did come out of that tomb. John 20 and 19. When therefore it was evening, on the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, the disciples were afraid, y'all. 
They were hiding. On Saturday, they were scared. On Sunday, everything changed. The disciples were filled with fear, and it said in John 20 that he stood in their midst. And you know what? He knew where they were. He knew they were hiding. And you know what he told them? He didn't fuss at them, did he? He didn't, he didn't condemn them, did he? He didn't come up and say, well, I told you. He said, fear not. Amen. Fear not. That's what the angels told the women at the grave. Fear not. What do you fear? Do you fear the future or the unknown? Listen. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which is surpasses all understanding, will fill you. What are you afraid of today? Now, you might be one of these macho people. I ain't afraid of nothing. I like what John Wayne said in that movie, Big Jake, his little grandson said, Are you afraid? He said, Yeah, but I ain't going to let them know it. You might be afraid today, but Jesus is the conqueror, and through Christ I can do all things. That's what it says. Do you fear death? Jesus conquered death. Hebrews 2.14 Since then the children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise also partook of the same. What does that mean? Jesus came down in flesh and blood, that through death Jesus might rend powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might deliver those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Did you catch that? Men walk around afraid of death. It's, it enslaves them. That's what Satan wants. Did you know fear comes from Satan? It doesn't come from God. And we walk around, we may be afraid of death. We may be afraid of tomorrow. We may be afraid of some man. But I'm going to tell you this. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Amen. What does that mean? Well, it's real simple. There's nothing, nothing that Jesus didn't overcome. Amen. Nothing. Good gracious. I heard a story that uh, David Charles was very apprehensive about his first airplane ride. In fact, he was scared to death. But after he got down, somebody asked him, said, well, how was it? He said, well... It wasn't as bad as I thought it might be, but to tell you the truth, I never put all my weight on that seat. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like us? God, I trust you, but I'm not going to put all my trust in you. How stupid is that? What problem do you have that Jesus can't solve? None. None. There is not a thing that besets you that Jesus cannot solve. But do you trust him enough? See, that's the question. I didn't put all my weight on the seat because I didn't trust that airplane. But I tell you, Jesus wants us to die daily and to give him everything. Amen. And the more you know Jesus, the more you know that he is trustworthy. That's what turned, that's what turned a group of scared disciples into a powerful bunch of Bible preaching men. And listen, do you know that there has never been one of those men, even though they all were martyred except John the Revelator, none of those men ever recanted their story. What does that tell you? It is true. If it had been a lie, somebody would have recanted. But they did not recant. So what are you afraid of today? What are you afraid of today? What does, it say? what does it say in Psalms 23 and 4? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because Jesus is with me. The good news from the tomb is this. Fear not. Take courage. Amen. I'm not there. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Point number three. Hope. Hope has been reborn. Jesus' disciples were feeling hopeless, gloomy, miserable, until they realized that Jesus was alive. And all of a sudden their hope is back. The Apostle Paul tells us, he said, I don't want you to hope like the world. I want you to have confidence that Jesus Christ overcome death, hell, and the grave. And listen, we can have hope. And when I say hope, I mean confidence for tomorrow and for eternity. Amen. And I tell you what amazes me about Christians. 
we have all the confidence that there's a place called heaven and that Jesus is going to take us there because of what he did on the cross. And yet, Betty, we don't have enough confidence to believe he's going to provide for tomorrow. What is wrong with that picture? Jesus said, I came that you might have, it, have life and have it more abundantly. What does that mean? That means that I can have a life here while I'm alive more abundantly. I can walk above the storms because of what Jesus did on the cross. The disciples knew that he came out of the grave. We have more proof that he rose from the dead than we have that Julius Caesar ever existed. Did you know that? Look it up. You can even Google that. It's there. In a secular world, it's there. So why can't we trust Jesus for tomorrow? Why are we living on Saturday? Why are we living on Saturday? In Job 14 and 4, Job asked a question. And I bet you we've asked this question. If a man dies, will he live again? Well, I want to read you Job's answer because he answered his own question. Job 19 and 25. Took him five chapters to answer it, but he answered it, okay? For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Now, did you catch that? I know what? My Redeemer liveth. If you don't know your Redeemer, if he's not your Redeemer, you don't know if he's alive or not. you got to know him. I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy the body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eye shall behold, and not another, Though my reins be consumed within me. What's he saying? My body's going to waste away. The worms are going to have it. But I am going to get a new body. And I am going to see my Redeemer with my eyes. Praise God. Because of the empty tomb, we can stand at the grave of a loved one and face tomorrow. Because of the empty tomb, no matter what fears we have, we can face tomorrow. No matter what is going on in this world, we can face tomorrow. Because of the empty tomb, the question has been answered. Yes, we will meet again. What about 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians 4 and 14 says, Knowing that He was raised up, the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you. You know what He's saying? Because Jesus come out of the tomb, we're coming up with him. We're going to get that new body. And I'll be so glad. I told Sherry yesterday, my body just is falling plumb apart. And I know it's hard for a 25-year-old to say that. <laughs> but it is. I hate to think about being 64. Uh, if death were the final words, then Christians have no hope. But 1 Corinthians 15 says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we are all men most miserable. Let me tell you what that means. There is more to it than just this life. Can I get an amen? amen. And thank God for that. Amen. How many of you know this life stinks? Amen. This life is terrible. But I have a risen Savior. Amen. I have a risen Savior that trumps every bad thing in this life. I have a risen Savior that loves me, watching over me, taking care of me, providing for me. And one great day, either I'm going to lay down in death and meet him or he's going to rapture me out of here and I'm going to meet him in the sky. But either way, I win. Amen. <laughs> On Easter morning about 2,000 years ago, Jesus really did rise from the dead. Yes, now you can believe it or not. That's up to you. And I know people say, well, I've heard that my whole life. My granddad heard it. His, his mom and daddy heard it. I still don't believe it. It's between you and God. It's between you and God. But I, I advise you to hit your knees and say, God, if it's real, show me. Amen. He will. He's risen to us. And he said, because I live, you can live. The good news from the tomb is this. Death has met its match. Fear has been conquered and hope has been reborn. That's the good news on Easter. It didn't come from CNN. It didn't come from Fox. It didn't come from WAFF. It didn't come from anywhere except heaven almighty. And you can count on it. <clears throat> He's not here. He's risen. And I want to tell you a true story and I'm through. 
There was a man by the name of John Griffith was in his early 20s. He was newly married and full of optimism. He and his wife had been blessed with a beautiful baby, and he was living the American dream. And then came 1929, the great stock market crash, the shattering of the American economy, and it devastated his dreams. It decimated Oklahoma where he lived, and, and he packed up and took his few possessions along with his wife and little son, and they headed east in an old Model A Ford truck. They made their way to the edge of the mighty Mississippi River, and he found a job tending one of the great railroad bridges that was there. Day after day, John would sit in the control room, and he would direct the enormous gears of the massive bridge over the mighty river. He would look out as the barges and as the ships went by. They glided gracefully under his elevated bridge. Each day he looked on sadly as those ships carried with them the shattered dreams of people from all across the United States who had been affected by the stock market crash. It wasn't until 1937 that a new dream began to be birthed in his mind. His young son was now eight years old and John had quickly caught a vision of a new life with his son Greg and they would work shoulder to shoulder and that he would teach his son what he was doing and that his son would take his place. Excitingly, the son asked one day if he could go with his dad and watch his dad operate the massive bridge. Greg looked on in wide-eyed amazement as his dad pressed down the huge lever that raised and lowered the vast bridge. As he watched, he thought that his father must surely be the greatest man alive because his dad single-handedly could control the movements of such a big structure. One day the dad said, son, let's walk down to the catwalk and walk out to the station where the, all the gears and all the mechanism is and we'll sit there and we'll eat lunch and we'll talk and fellowship and have a great time. The bridge was raised. Another train wouldn't be by for an hour. So they went down, and his dad got to telling him stories about <clears throat> the destination of the ships that were going past them. His dad got to telling him stories about the barges and all the things that were on there. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of telling a tale about the time that the river overflowed its bank, he and his son were startled back to reality by the shrieking whistle of a distant train. Looking at his watch in disbelief, the father already saw that it was 107, and immediately he remembered that the bridge was still up and that a Memphis passenger express would be by in just a moment. In his calmest tone he could muster, he told his son, he said, you stay right here and do not move. I will run up the catwalk and I will lower the bridge, and when the train goes by, I will come back and get you. Once he got to the catwalk, he searched the river to make sure that no ships were in sight. And then, as he had been trained to do, he looked straight down beneath the bridge into the gearbox to make sure everything was good. And as he looked down, he saw something horrible. His heart froze in his chest, for there below him, in the massive gearbox that housed the colossal gears that moved this bridge up and down, was his eight-year-old son laying on top of the gears. Evidently, the son had decided to get up and follow his father, and yet he fell into the gears and could not get out. This was the apple of his eye. This was his son. Panicking, his mind probed in every direction. It, it flashed through his mind that he would run down the stairs, hit the catwalk, run out there with the rope, tie it off, lower himself down, pull his son up, crawl back up out of the gearbox, get back on the catwalk, run back to the steps, run up the steps, and let this bridge down just in time. But he knew he didn't have enough time. He could hear the whistle getting closer. And he's thinking, what am I going to do? If I let the bridge down, my son will be killed. If I don't let the bridge down, all those hundreds of passengers on the Memphis Express will be killed. What do I do? His mind is working overtime. He, he is scared. He's perspiring. 
<clears throat> and he knew what he had to do. He knew what he had to do. And with every ounce of force that he had, and every ounce of courage that he had, he pulled the lever out and pushed it down to lower the bridge. Before the train got close enough to drown out the screamings, he heard his own son screaming, Father, Father. And the son was killed. The bridge came down. The man is in his booth watching and as this train is screaming by, he has tears running down his face. And he sees in the cars, he sees a conductor checking his watch as if nothing had happened. He sees a man sitting there reading the newspaper as if nothing had happened. He sees a woman putting on makeup and combing her hair as if nothing has happened. And then he sees a young boy in the train about the age of his son eating a bowl of ice cream. And all of a sudden he started beating the desk and crying. Don't you know what I did for you? Don't you know that I killed my own son for you? And listen, I'm afraid that we're the people in the train screaming by. We're reading the paper. We're checking our watch. We're putting on makeup. We're eating ice cream. And God is up in heaven saying, don't you know what I did for you? Do you know God today? It's Easter Sunday. I can't think of a better time to get saved than today. Jesus paid the price you could never pay. That man paid the price. He killed his son. God killed his son for you and I. So are you willing to accept his call today? I want you to bow your heads for just a moment. We're not going to drag this out. No music, Ricky, no video, no nothing. Do you know him today? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, it's Easter Sunday. And Lord, every day for a Christian ought to be Easter Day because of what Jesus did on the cross. Now, Lord, I pray if there's somebody here today who doesn't know you, or maybe, God, they're saved, but they're living in Saturday and not on Sunday. I pray, God, that you would give them the courage to step out right now. God, they don't have to talk to me. I don't need to know their circumstances. They just need to talk to you. Lord, give them courage to step out right now. Lord, we thank you privately, publicly, and corporately for what you did on the cross. And, Lord, we know we didn't deserve it. But you did it because you love us. Now, Lord, with our heads bowed, give us the courage to step out right now. In Christ's name. Won't you come? I know it's quiet. You know, Jesus hung on that cross. He hung in the middle of heaven and earth. And he did it because he loved you and I. Are you willing to step out right now and say, hey, God, I need more of you? I promise you, nobody here will laugh. We'll all rejoice. 